uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Angelica Gonzalez, who is joining us from her, her virtual teaching faculty, not teaching faculty, virtual position. She's joining us virtually <laughs> from Rutgers University, where she is faculty in the Department of Biology, the Biology Department, and the Center for Computational and Integrative Biology. Dr. Gonzalez has um, did most of her training, her graduate training in Chile, uh, followed by postdoctoral work uh, in at the University of British Columbia before joining faculty at Rutgers, I believe, uh, right from that, and um, has really established uh, expertise in leadership in scaling ecology and understanding how how traits and organisms scale up to ecosystem processes and, and what it means when um, you account for processes at, at different scales for, for ecosystem function. And so I'm really excited to hear this seminar today. I, I think she's got a lot of really uh, interesting research going on and, um, and, and with that, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Shannon, for that uh, sweet like introduction and I want to thank Matt for inviting me today. Um, I'm very excited to be here virtually. Uh, I was telling Matt and Shannon that um, I've been wanting to go to the Care Institute since I was a PhD student in Chile and I have never had the chance till now, which is virtual. Uh, but we were laughing at, at saying that, well, I'm getting a little bit closer every time. So maybe next time I'll be able to like be there in person. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to share my um, slides. Um, um, let me go with full screen. So um, I'm a I'm a broad like thinker ecologist that uh, gets very excited about a multitude of like topics. And, and these topics, I guess that they are all bind together by trying to understand like matter and energy exchange and how the availability of this matter and energy um, can constrain ecological processes. And the seminar that I put together today uh, is mainly focused on two main projects that, uh, well, yeah, I will say two main projects that we are currently uh, like running in my lab. I know that in the abstract, and maybe the majority of you don't remember, <laughs> I have included uh, like uh, some information that I was going to talk about, like some spider energetics, and I decided to leave that out of my talk. So I, I hope I'm not going to disappoint anybody, but uh, I'll be happy to chat about it. But I'm not going to be like presenting uh, like that research today. So the title of my talk is like understanding the structure and function of ecological systems across the space and time. And because we don't need to get till the end uh, of my talk, I want to make sure that I give the proper acknowledgments to my uh, amazing group of collaborators um, and students that uh, have allowed me to develop the work that I'm going to present you uh, today, and also to my like funding sources, uh, like mainly NSF and uh, the Integrative like Diversity Center in uh, Leipzig, Germany. Um, so starting with like energy and material harvesting are the most important uh, or more fundamental processes in living organisms, because every single living organism needs to obtain this matter and energy to support biological functions. And we are not the exception. And just to let you know, this is not a crab. So I'm sorry, I know that we are before lunch, but um, so this uh, exchange of energy and material happened in trophic interactions, right? That uh, when we put together these like this multiple like trophic interactions in like food webs, we know that uh, this there's a constant flow of like energy and matter, right? That it can have important like consequences over ecological and evolutionary dynamics because every single living organism on Earth, right, needs to obtain these resources to survive and reproduce. 
And we have learned a lot about certain traits that uh, matter, that uh, matter in terms of this like energy and matter exchange. Um, we know that body size is a muscle trait and is like a, is fundamental to these like energetic exchanges among like organisms. But we also have uh, a lot of theoretical and empirical evidence that suggests that the elemental composition of living organisms, that means like the uh, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and other element composition, right? Can also control the flux storage and turnover of energy and matter in, in ecological systems. Um, and one interesting aspect of this is that all living organisms, including us, are composed by the same chemical elements illustrated here in this periodic table, which you may remember from like kindergarten. Um, and here, the intensity of the blue tones represent the uh, relative importance of that element in uh, living organisms. And here we're talking about uh, like 26 elements that like compose living matter across domains of life. Um, but another interesting aspect of this is that even when all living organisms are composed by the same chemical elements, there is a large variation in the proportion of these elements in living biomass. And here, this is a like a synthetic work that is ongoing in my lab, which we are analyzing the patterns of uh, elemental composition across a different type of organisms like vertebrates and invertebrates from terrestrial, marine, and uh, first water systems. And you can see here that there is a large range of variation. And I'm showing you here the uh, relationship between nitrogen and phosphorus in the bulk biomass of uh, these like uh, different types of organisms from like fishes to uh, terrestrial invertebrates. But we also see even within insect, insecta, for example, across orders of insects, we see a large variation in terms of the uh, mean of their entropy ratios, but also in the range of variation of these uh, elemental ratios. Now, there are several hypotheses of why uh, like uh, this variation exists. Some of those hypotheses point out to, you know, evolutionary history, some others like body size scaling, um, but also like the like trophic level effects. Um, but one thing that we need to understand is that, well, chemical elements are the building blocks of living organisms. And we know that, for example, like carbon, right, uh, is present in structural components of like plants, for example, lignin and cellulose. We also find a lot of like carbon in the exoskeletons of like arthropods and some pigments of uh, marine organ or uh, like uh, aquatic organisms, right? Uh, that, for example, this here uh, is like a zooplankton that it looks like a like a wax crayon because of the amount of like carbon they have. Some of these pigments protect organisms, for example, from UV radiation. Uh, nitrogen is highly present also in the uh, like chitinous exoskeletons of like arthropods. Uh, we know, you know, like uh, plants and chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a is a high uh, it's a high demanding like nitrogen component and some of the pigments of zooplankton also like uh, UV protectors like are like nitrogen rich. And in terms of like phosphorus, we know that, for example, us as vertebrates have a huge investment in uh, skeletons that is uh, like mainly composed by like uh, phosphorus, but phosphorus is also present in uh, as, like nucleic acids and ATP and some other uh, like molecules like ribosomal RNA, for example. Um, so the interesting thing uh, of these like uh, differences in, in terms of the elemental composition of living organisms and one of the high like I hypothesize like drivers of these differences I mentioned you before uh, is like trophic level. And we have done some studies like uh, testing for the role of like uh, trophic position on some of these like elemental contents of living organisms. The, the, this is a plot that shows the results of a study that we did 
across Central South America, in which we were studying uh, like very like uh, localized aquatic communities, and we analyzed the uh, elemental composition of uh, the two main like trophic groups in the system, the tridivores and predators. Uh, here we have the frequency distribution of the nitrogen content of the individuals across that geographical uh, area, with purple being predators and green being the tridivores. And here in more detail, the different study sites that span from like South Brazil till Puerto Rico, in which uh, you can see that predators like consistently show like higher like nitrogen content in their like bodies compared to the tridivores. So we can also take an even larger like geographical view, and this is the uh, an ongoing project uh, looking at uh, global patterns and potential mechanisms of the stoichiometry of living organisms. And here I'm showing you the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the biomass of predators and prey in aquatic and terrestrial systems, now like grouped by large uh, like geographical areas, like polar areas, temperate areas, and tropical. And you can see that again, consistently in this case, because the CN, like the CN of the predators is like smaller or lower than the CN of the prey, right? And these differences like are consistent between aquatic and terrestrial systems. Unfortunately, uh, we're just compiling uh, like data on like polar systems in terrestrial uh, environments. So uh, by the time that we analyzed the data, we didn't have that. Um, but uh, this like uh, increase in CN or in the prey is related to the lower nitrogen content in the prey. So these differences in the elemental composition of like prey and their predators or consumer resource interactions can have, and we know because of like uh, an ample evidence uh, from terrestrial and aquatic studies can have consequences over like the ecology of these like organisms. And that is exactly what ecological stoichiometry studies. Uh, and just to give you a brief overview of uh, what is this field is uh, like focus on the balance of energy and multiple chemical elements in ecological systems. And um, we like in a very simplified manner here, we can imagine that we have a resource and we have a consumer, the resource in green, the consumer in orange. And these are composed by uh, chemical elements, right, in different portion. One thing that we know um, is that consumers tend to be like very homeostatic in their like elemental composition. They, they are still somehow plastic, but they are much more uh, homeostatic in terms of their uh, stoichiometry compared to primary producers, which are very flexible. They can do luxury consumption and use the vacuoles to accumulate some like elements. Um, so they, so then again, animals are like a subject of a stronger homeostatic control in their elemental composition and like uh, autotrophs or not. Um, and that may have consequences because if, for example, the demands for a particular nutrient, in this case, we have here highlighted nitrogen, right? Are higher than the supply of those nutrients by the resources. Um, organisms are not passive reactors, right? They do display uh, like a diversity of like pre and post absorption mechanisms to potentially deal with elemental imbalances, right? They can increase consumption rate, they can switch prey, they can combine prey, or they can, once they have ingested their resources, they can for example, retain their like food longer in their guts, right? And be very efficient at extracting nutrients. But if these elemental imbalances are like beyond what the physiological mechanisms that like consume or behavioral mechanisms that the consumers can uh, like uh, use to deal with, uh, we can have like some consequences over consumer growth. Um, and elemental imbalances, right? Uh, it's not just like the difference between the like uh, like the elemental composition of the consumer compared to the resource, but there is also an important component in stoichiometry that is called the Treskel elemental ratio, which is the ratio at which like uh, consumers may switch from carbon to nutrient limitation depending on the demands they may have and obviously the supply. So this is a story of like supply versus demand. 
But if we do have like, uh, like severe elemental imbalances, these imbalances may uh, generate constraints or upon organismal growth and also over the recycling of elements in nature. For example, in our, uh, in our case, right, our consumer has high demands of nitrogen, but the resource has low uh, supply of nitrogen. So then the recycling of nitrogen back to the environment, is gonna be limited. And we do know based on empirical evidence that these like differential recycling of elements can have consequences over the rest of the community. So, uh, like stoichiometry of living organisms then allow us to uh, link biogeochemistry with food web interactions and ecosystem metabolism, but also has consequences over like a multitude of uh, ecological phenomena, like trophic interactions, like uh, imposing nutrient limitations and the fluxes and transformation rates of like energy and matter in nature. So what are the research interests in my lab? Well, we're mainly interested in how energetic and stoichiometric constraints can combine uh, to shape the structure and dynamic of ecological systems. And we do this, uh, we tackle this problem actually from like a multi-perspective uh, like uh, approach. Uh, we do use like large scale surveys, right? In which we uh, collect data, like sampling in large geographical areas. Um, we do field experiments, mainly in situ, in uh, different places of the world. And we do like data synthesis approaches too, in which we combine like raw data from some phylogenetic traits and climatic data, or we do like meta-analysis. So we're trying to understand the like ecological uh, like the responses of ecological systems to environmental changes, and these environmental changes may be natural or human induced. So one of the main things that I'm interested in terms of environmental changes are the effects that humans are having on biological cycles. Uh, and we do know, right, that but since the Industrial Revolution, we have altered the carbon cycle in about like 30%. But if we put this into perspective, we know that actually we have altered the nitrogen cycle in like over like 160% because of our like uh, extended use of like fertilizers, right, to promote plant growth. Um, but if we put nitrogen into perspective, <laughs> we know that we have, uh, we have altered the fossil cycle in almost like 300%. Um, and the problem with like fossils, right, is that it, it has a very different uh, like cycle than like nitrogen and fossils because it's only a solid cycle and fossils need to be mined. And a lot of our fossils is going uh, like into aquatic systems. Which obviously because this is matter, we are not losing any of these elements, but we are just like relocating them in uh, our planet, right? Um, so then it's not just these, like, uh, as I mentioned, this relocation of like nitrogen and fossils, right? We know that there are, there have been like significant changes uh, in like many places of the world uh, in terms of like nitrogen deposition here. These like two plots show us the comparison pre-industrial and modern time, like till like 2013, right? And how in some areas there was more red areas, we have like a high uh, like um, rate of nitrogen deposition and the same happens in uh, for fossils, right? Um, a little bit different is like nitrogen tends to be more global, right? And fossils, we see that the South Hemisphere, uh, at least like if you look at Africa and South America and like uh, Asia, we see some more increase in like fossil deposition compared to what is happening in some areas in the North Hemisphere. And so these changes in biogeochemical cycles, we, uh, we predict, right, that they are, uh, they may alter these like consumer resource interactions by like even like increasing these elemental imbalances and constraints over consumer growth. And we explore some of these ideas with an experiment that we run in the field using two key players here, like chironomids and caddis flies, which are like important organisms in any type of aquatic system, like streams, rivers, lakes. Uh, but we use some particular systems, which I'm going to describe a little bit later in more detail. But these like uh, like tank bromeliads, which are uh, like uh, terrestrial plants, but they 
create aquatic habitats for many important invertebrate species. So we did this like manipulative experiment in which we added nitrogen and phosphorus uh, to look at the, ups, the effects of absolute changes in absolute amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus, but also in their ratios. And, uh, and we measure like growth rate responses of these like two type of like organisms. And what we found is like chironomids, they responded much strongly to like fossil additions uh, in terms of the growth rate, which suggested that these organisms are fossil limited. When we compare the responses uh, with uh, caddis flies, we found completely the opposite, that caddis flies actually, they responded more strongly in their growth rates to like nitrogen additions. Um, if you see here for uh, uh, chironomids, right, they have significant responses to fossils, but they didn't have like significant responses to nitrogen. And on the other side, uh, caddis flies that they had strong significant responses to nitrogen, they didn't have responses to phosphorus. So this was uh, suggesting, right, that these organisms are, oh, my, I think my cursor is lost. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's my battery. Um, yeah, it's my, it's my battery. Um, okay. Um, so I can continue, but I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to move my cursor anymore. So we have these like nitrogen and fossil uh, limitation uh, that is different for different type of organisms. So then we ask ourselves, right? What may explain these like different responses of uh, to nitrogen and uh, fossil enrichment? Um, and when we look here on the um, right side of the, the uh, slide is the elemental composition of uh, chironomids and caddis flies. So chironomids are in red, caddis flies are in blue. And you can see that caddis, uh, chironomids have higher fossils content than caddis flies. So higher like uh, fossils content uh, to us based on ecological stoichiometry, which like tell us that the elemental composition of living organisms reflect their demands for these elements. It's kind of like supporting the ideas that, uh, or the findings that we had before that these organisms were fossils limited, right? They have high demands for fossils in their body and then when, and they were limited in the system. Once we uh, added fossils to the environment, they increased their growth rates. So what happened in terms of like caddis flies, they show the completely opposite pattern. They have higher nitrogen content in their bodies compared to um, chironomids, which again supports our findings of these organisms potentially being limited by nitrogen, right? And responding more strongly to increases in nitrogen in the environment. So caddis flies are interesting um, uh, organisms because they secrete uh, silk to build their like cases, like spiders secrete silk to build their webs. They secrete silk to glue together the cases. And silk is a protein, it's mainly a protein as it's a high nitrogen rich uh, molecule, right? Uh, so then these organisms, right? The high demands for uh, like nitrogen could be even more increased uh, because our analysis were focused on the, on the body of caddis flies, but the amount of nitrogen they put in extension to uh, building their bodies, right? To build the cases. So that may even increase more the demands of nitrogen they may have. So one thing that we know, unfortunately, is that most of the studies on stoichiometry and the responses of organisms to changes in biogeochemical cycles have been focused on species specific responses are very localized in particular systems, uh, but there are very few, uh, I will say that only a handful of, of studies uh, that have evaluated how ecological communities may respond to changes in biogeochemical cycles, looking at communities as a whole, and then describing these responses, right, uh, at the level of changes in species richness, abundance, biomass, species composition, or stoichiometry. And we know that not all, all organisms are gonna respond equally, right, to these like changes in elemental imbalances. I just show you that some organisms may respond better to fossils, some other better to nitrogen, right? And some others may not respond uh, like strongly to either of like these like elements. Um, 
because organisms like have different ways to respond to these like changes in the environment. And if we look at them from a community perspective, right, and we have this like hypothetical community in their initial state here in A, we have three species with uh, organisms that have like different traits uh, that represented here by the shade of these like the different like symbols. Then we have uh, like response that is related to uh, phenotypic plasticity, right? Um, and these responses are general to any kind of like changes in the environment, right? In our case, we're obviously interested in changes in uh, the availability of like uh, elements in nature. So we have uh, this like phenotypic plasticity and then organisms can respond, right? To changes in the environment without like major like uh, consequences over like communities, but then the other responses could be natural selection and species sorting, right? If these like changes in the environment go beyond certain threshold, then species won't be able, for example, some species won't be able to adapt and they will disappear from the environment, like shown here in C, right? Where we lost this like, kind of rectangular species. Um, and then we can also see responses at the level of species sorting, right? Like changes in like the relative abundances of the species or species composition. Um, so we can tease apart these different mechanisms, right? By using uh, like the extended price equation that allow us to uh, like uh, look at the relative importance of uh, at least two of these like main drivers, uh, plasticity and species sorting. And because I don't do long-term studies in terms of like uh, to, to be able to uh, test for like, uh, it, like adaptation, right? Uh, we can at least focus on like short-term responses that are elemental plasticity and species sorting in response to changes in nutrient uh, availability. So, um, so we are, we are currently running uh, like a project to focus on the effects of nutrient enrichment on the structure and function of uh, whole ecosystems. This is an NSF funded study, and this is in collaboration with Dr. Gustavo Romero from UNICAMP in Brazil, Dr. Nico Telly from a University of Vermont, and two amazing grad students that have been doing all the hard work, uh, Lindsay Pett from uh, Vermont and Mark Nessel from uh, Rutgers My Lab. Um, so we are using here aquatic communities uh, in natural microcosms. Uh, we're using pitcher plants and, oh, sorry, I, I messed up the picture actually. I don't, I don't know what happened here, but like the tank bromeliad is not a tank bromeliad. <laughs> it's again a, a pitcher plant. Uh, you will see a tank bromeliad later. But um, we have, uh, so I'm using pitcher plants and tank and bromeliads as like natural microcosm systems, right? These two types of like plants are called also like phytotelmata, which means that they uh, are like terrestrial plants that create aquatic habitat for like a diversity of species. And uh, so pitcher plants, as you may know, they are carnivorous plants, but they, they live in box and under low, normally low nutrient conditions, right? And they rely on an aquatic food web to decompose the prey that falls into the pitcher, right? And then uh, because of the decomposition processes happen, the plants uptake nutrients. And uh, the, the food web, right, is like relatively simple but complex at the same time, that it's like a, a analog to food webs in other like aquatic systems. And then we have tank bromeliads, which are the the tritus based ecosystems. Tank bromeliads distribute from Florida till uh, like South Argentina. Um, and they, again, they have this amazing capacity in which they accumulate water between their leaves and they create aquatic habitat for a diversity of invertebrates and even vertebrate organisms like tadpoles, like frogs, go into these like plants and they lay their like eggs and then the tadpoles develop. They are mainly supported by litter 
that falls from surrounding trees. Uh, so that's the main source of energy. And the diagram on the right side um, is showing you like the pathways in which we have uh, in one, we have left leader, right? That is being like colonized by microorganisms. And then uh, like uh, the, over the surface of this leader, like we have bacterial like and fungal biofilms. Then we have different type of like the tritivore organisms uh, belonging to multiple like functional groups like filter feeders, shredders, scrappers, collectors that decompose that uh, the tritus and then release nutrients that are being uptaken by the by the plant. Um, but these plants, we also know that um, depending on the amount of light they get, they may also rely on autochthonous primary production. So the, this uh, we have quantified the amount of like algae production in the times of these like bromelias and we have evaluated by using the stable isotopes uh, the relative importance of uh, like the tritus material versus algae materials for the rest of the food web. So like the algae can play an important role um, depending on the uh, light conditions at which bromelias are exposed. So these systems are amazing uh, because they are highly tractable. That we can replicate them. Uh, we can run experiments in the field. Uh, we can set up like realistic communities because the aquatic communities living inside these like uh, systems they have co-evolved together. Um, so they we we have assembled a multitude of experiment testing for general ecological theory, uh, like using both like pitcher plants and time for milliards um, in situ in different like uh, parts of the world. And they are not just important because we can like easily like set up experiments uh, testing general ecological theory, but they they also, bromelias in particular, they hold most of the standing water in tropical systems. Um, and here you can see this uh, bromelia tank that can hold more than more than 50 liters of water. Obviously, these are not the plants that we're using in our experiments. It would be extremely hard to like uh, like handle experiments in these like large plants and like highly replicate them. We use a, like a, a little bit smaller ones that I can hold like between one and two liters of water normally. <clears throat> so what we want to know right in this experiment is like what are the effects of like nitrogen fossils enrichment on the structure and function of whole aquatic systems by looking at uh, a diversity of responses uh, like species richness, abundance, biomass, species compositions, and the stoichiometry of like the organisms in there. And for this uh, project, we have like two parts. So one is, an, uh, we ran um, an experimental manipulation of nitrogen and fossils inputs um, to test and to quantify and test the effects of like these like changes in uh, the availability of nutrients on all these different type of like community and ecosystem responses that I mentioned to you before. So we ran an experiment uh, near Vermont um, and another one in uh, Brazil uh, with like similar design in which we have this like surface response in, uh, which we combine different levels of nitrogen with different levels of phosphorus. So we want to know what is the effect of the changes in the absolute amounts of like nitrogen and phosphorus, but also on different like ratios, which are like indicated here as numbers in the different like circles in the like upper plot and also in the bottom plot. And the values for nitrogen and phosphorus that we use in this experiment are bracketing those that are the current levels of nitrogen fossils deposition for temperate and tropical systems. Um, so like we, what we did, right, it, it's in both places and I'll, I'll just show you pictures from like the like experiments that we did with like, um, like pitcher plants. We run these experiments, as I mentioned before, in this like kind of like surface design, right? Each one of these like circles in the left side of the slide um, is a plant that is identified, right? Because of the treatment that it got. Uh, and we let it run for like three, four months. Um, and then um, we, we collected uh, a diversity of like information uh, of the pre and post experiment on the responses of the different components of the ecosystem. 
for this is just to give you an example, right? We have uh, responses that are can be classified as like morphological uh, re responses by the plants themselves, biomass responses of each one of the components of the ecosystem. That means the microbial community, the phytoplankton, the invertebrates. Uh, we're doing uh, elemental analysis of like the different components again, like from the plant tissue, the like fluid. Uh, or the water uh, contained in the tanks, the stoichiometry of like all the different uh, like invertebrates and uh, the microbes inside, and some other like um, more like environmental or fluid parameters, for example, temperature, pH, uh, diversity of organisms, um, etc. Uh, and these are similar to the like, parameters that we have been collecting for the second experiment that was run in Brazil um, in uh, Cardoso Island with like bromeliads um, in which we had a, like a large team of people like helping with uh, like the sampling and the collection of each one of these like uh, information for the different components of the ecosystem. So unfortunately for this part of the experiment because of COVID like all our like the majority of our analysis has been delayed a bit so I'm not going to show you results so you're going to have to invite me maybe in one more year so then I get to go finally <laughs> to the Care Institute and uh, I can tell you more about like our findings but we do have some results related to the second part of this like project that is a large biogeographical study um of again ecosystem structures stoichiometry and function across these like gradients of nitrogen and phosphorus deposition the upper like uh, figures on the on the right side, uh, like show you like atmospheric deposition of nitrogen on the left uh, and phosphorus on the right for like North America. And you can see each one of those numbers correspond to a location where we sample. We sample more than 25 locations. Not me, that was like amazing, like Lindsay Pet from like uh, University of Vermont who did like these like larger scale sampling you can see like almost from Florida till all the way till like the border with Canada and then we also did something similar uh, in uh, across Brazil uh, and you're seeing in the bottom plots uh, like nitrogen and fossil deposition and the location of the different sites that we sampled unfortunately we had to cancel the second field system for Brazil last year because uh, because of COVID uh, our intention was to increase the number of like sites where we were sampling uh, like these systems, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that that uh, is uh, going to happen, unfortunately. We did sample like 10 sites in Brazil uh, and 20 something sites in, um, in North America. And we're just starting to analyze our data. Uh, so here, I'm just giving you a glimpse of what we have found. Uh, like what we have here in the map is uh, now we're looking at the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, just to give you an idea what is the range of variation, like from 13 to 205. Um, and then we have some, we have a multitude of responses. Obviously we're testing very specific hypotheses, but just to uh, give you like a, a brief overview, we know that at least like phosphorus deposition has a significant effect on like plant tissue phosphorus. As you can see in the upper graph here, our plants increase their phosphorus uh, tissue like uh, uh, phosphorus content as the amount of like phosphorus like deposition increases. Um, and something similar happens with like uh, nitrogen to phosphorus deposition. So we can see that as nitrogen, as the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus deposited increases, the N to P tissue in uh, pitcher plants is also increasing. And the same happens with the fluid, right? So we are starting to like, uh, like uncover some interesting responses uh, at the level of the plants at least to these like uh, increases in uh, like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus deposition. Uh, and here, like some other results, like in relationship to nitrogen deposition, we are seeing also like, for example, increases in nitrogen deposition, uh, like are like generating more acidic type of like uh, fluid in like pitcher plants. And then 
what we see in the bottom graph is more related to the structure of the community in which we see some kind of like handshake relationship but like uh, it, the abundance of invertebrates in picture plus uh, like tends to peak in like a middle uh, larger in the position um, states, which is not surprising. That was uh, like kind of like our hypothesis that um, intermediate like levels of like the position will see the highest uh, like uh, diversity and abundance of organisms on the extremes and to be or nitrogen limited or still like uh, an excess and saturation of like nitrogen in the system. So um, th there are a lot of other results to come. Um, we are in the process of uh, like analyzing our data, but unfortunately, um, yeah, COVID took a toll on, on both of our labs in Vermont and here. So um, yeah, in, 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 we hope that like shortly we will have uh, more part of this like puzzle completed. Um, another thing that we are doing to understand how nitrogen and fossil uh, enrichments uh, may affect invertebrate communities is uh, like through like meta-analysis. And uh, we, we ran a meta-analysis looking at the effects of nitrogen and fossil enrichment on aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates. This is the paper that is in review and is was in collaboration with Gustavo Romero from UNICAMP. And uh, there were two students uh, of my lab involved with this. Like this student was led by uh, Mark Nessel, which who did an amazing job on putting together these like meta analysis. So we were able to compile 207 studies looking at these like effects of nitrogen and fossil enrichment over like aqua uh, aquatic and terrestrial ortho and like invertebrate communities. Those represent uh, more than 1500 cases of the studies of experiments testing the effects of these nutrients on uh, like uh, invertebrates. And here, the map is showing you the location of these uh, studies and the size of the balls are the number of uh, case studies per uh, location. The color, the brown represents terrestrial, the blue represents like uh, aquatic studies. And some of the results, so we are seeing like a significant negative effect of like nitrogen and fossil enrichment in um, aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates. Um, the most interesting results, uh, I'm gonna like, unfortunately I don't have my, my mouse now and I don't wanna, maybe I should. Um, I do have, if you, I'm gonna, I'm going to try because it's going to be very hard for me to walk you through the uh let me change my batteries i'm sorry never it's never happened to me before till now i'll just replace the batteries of this let's see if i can walk you through All right, I'm back. Can you, I guess that you can see my cursor now, right? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, okay, so what we have here is three types of responses uh, of orthopod commu uh, invertebrate communities to nutrient enrichment. So we have here abundance, biomass, and diversity in aquatic and terrestrial systems. And also, we have different type of nutrients. This is in red. We have nitrogen addition in green. We have a green and triangle. We have plus nitrogen plus fossils, and the blue square is like fossil additions. So I'm just going to start with the most boring results, and then we're going to go to the most exciting. So there are a lot of responses that show no significant uh, like effects, right? To or no significant responses to these additions. Um, they are crossing the zero line here, right? The intervals of confidence. There are some other responses that are uh, like show like a lot of variation, and that is mainly related to low sample sizes, which are indicated here. So some results, some of these like uh, results that we found not uh, like significant, were, are maybe due to 
the lack of robustness because of the small sample sizes. But one thing that we found is that at least in aquatic systems, the addition of like fossils like uh, produce like a strong general, a strong positive effect on the biomass of aquatic invertebrates. But actually the most, in, the most interesting part is are the responses at the level of abundance in aquatic and terrestrial systems. As you can see, there is a consistent negative response of uh, aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates to the additions of in aquatic in the aquatic habitat to the additions of uh, nitrogen and fossils together um, to fossils, and then a significant negative response of terrestrial invertebrates to the additions of like nitrogen and nitrogen and fossils together. Um, unfortunately, some of the other responses um, are like we're not, uh, or at least we, we don't see a, like a significant effect. For example, here for the aquatic abundance, we don't see a significant effect of like nitrogen additions. The same happened in uh, terrestrial systems for fossils. We don't see a significant effect of like uh, fossil additions. But the, inter the most interesting aspect as I was telling you before are like negative responses of invertebrates in both aquatic and terrestrial systems to uh, nutrient additions. And these uh, we're interested in this because, you know, like recently we have heard a lot about this, uh, like global declines in uh, invertebrates and in particular insects uh, across like terrestrial and aquatic systems at a global level. And we think that nutrient addition could be one of those like drivers, like uh, underlying these like declines in invertebrate populations. The other thing that we compare was between terrestrial, uh, uh, sorry, between tropical and temperate systems. So here, what we have is like temperate systems in the upper plots, and then tropical systems in the bottom ones for aquatic and terrestrial. And again, we see some responses are not significant. Uh, some other responses show extremely large uh, like variation in in the um, among studies, right? Like these ones here. Some of them, again, are related. Some of these, like, like heterogeneous responses, may be related to uh, low sample sizes. But there are some responses that were very robust. And for example, here you can see that uh, temperate systems, and actually both temperate and tropical systems, right? They have uh, negative responses to nutrient addition, and in general, tropical habitats tend to respond. Uh, like here, tend to respond more strongly to nutrient enrichment compared to uh, temperate uh, invertebrates. And we can see, for example, if you compare the addition of nitrogen here in red for terrestrial tropical with the addition of like nitrogen in temperate uh, terrestrial, you can see this like a symbol here uh, is illustrating this significant differences between the two type of responses. In terms of responses to N2P, for both of them, uh, both of them are negative. The tropical tends to be a little bit larger in magnitude, but the differences between the two types of systems are uh, are not like significant from it, significantly different from each other. Uh, among other things that we looked was. Uh, you know, species specific responses to like these like nutrient enrichment uh, like type of scenarios. Um, again, we have aquatic systems and terrestrial systems and we classify the different organisms based on what the authors the authors information in like the responses they measured and there is a lot of variation in terms of like the magnitude of the effect but not that much variation in terms of the direction of the effects, right? We see that the majority of the effects tend to be negative, which means that there is a decrease in abundance in, in, in this case of uh, invertebrates across the different type of uh, like taxonomic groups. Um, the, there, is, there are strong effects of uh, negative effects of like the addition of both nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and in some cases, nitrogen, for, especially for terrestrial systems, the only positive effect that we found that it was very robust was a, an increase in the abundance of nematodes with like phosphorus additions. 
some studies like have done experiments with like nematodes and under the light of stoichiometry and uh, like nematodes seem to always respond to like positive to phosphorus and that suggests that these organisms even when we don't know yet uh, may have high demands for phosphorus so they are tiny they grow very fast they may have very high demands of fossils to like you know to allocate to ribosomal RNA, which is a fossils rich molecule that is responsible to for the uh, generation of like new biomass. Um, so this the studies in review. So uh, let's hope that it's going to be out uh, like pretty soon. But we were very excited about the results that we were uh, that we found. Uh, another thing that this study like gave us was like a, uh, so, some important information about like uh, gaps in our understanding or in the research that we have been doing as ecologists, right? In terms of the responses of nutrient enrichment, uh, like from like by like uh, different type of like organisms or in different type of like systems. And one of the most striking things that we found is that 75% of the studies have been done in terrestrial systems compared to only 25% in aquatic systems. 90% of the studies have been focused on temperate systems and only 10% in tropical systems. So we know very little of uh, the responses of like tropical invertebrates to like neutral enrichments, even when we know that like fossils deposition uh, and fossils enrichment in general is like a, is being an important driver in tropical systems. And like there are like uh, recent studies showing that nitrogen enrichment is also increasing in tropical areas. And then uh, almost 50% of the studies were focused on insects. And then the, there are like several different groups that are underrepresented in the responses to these like uh, nutrient enrichment. So it, it, it's an important discovery in, in the sense that we can now, you know, like, like make suggestions about where we should be paying attention, right, in terms of like responses of like uh, aquatic and terrestrial invertebrate communities to these like uh, different enrichments. Following uh, along the same lines in terms of data synthesis approaches uh, to understand um, how nutrients impact the uh, invertebrates across different types of like habitats, but also how stoichiometry may play a role. Unfortunately, in the meta-analysis, we weren't able to test for an stoichiometric effect from the point of view of the uh, invertebrates because there were no data reported, right? Um, but we got funded by the IB Center in Leipzig, Germany, uh, for a project focused on the biogeographical and um, microevolutionary patterns in organismal stoichiometry, stoichiometric diversity. Uh, and this is a project that I'm uh, working with my copy uh, Dr. Olivier Desaval from the INRA in France. Um, and we have put together like a large data set uh, using raw data on carbon, nitrogen, and fossils content of or, like autotrophs and animals. Um, so this current database has around 29,000 like uh, individual organisms uh, with data for CNP. Uh, of those, around 9,000 are autotrophs and around 20,000 are animals and animals were talking here about invertebrates, but also vertebrates. And we, this number of individuals uh, compose more than 6,000 species with like uh, more than 1,300 for aquatic systems and almost 5,000 for terrestrial systems. So this is individual level data on the elemental composition of living organisms. And obviously, we compile not just the, the numerical data, but we also have like text data identifying, uh, for example, the system here, the map is showing you we have data for freshwater, for marine and terrestrial, right, distributed around the world. We have other like data in terms of the type of habitat and life history traits associated to these different type of organisms, for example, body size or trophic group. Um, and we are uh, with this project um, that is a working group uh, 
um, and we had, uh, unfortunately, our second and third meeting has have been online, even our, like a team has been amazing, but it has also like delayed us uh, a little bit in terms of our uh, like analysis, but the type of questions we are addressing here are focused on understanding like large scale biogeographical patterns, and the mechanisms underlying these patterns uh, in terms of stoichiometric, uh, stoichiometric diversity. And also we are characterizing the ecological and evolutionary constraints that may underlie the stoichiometric niche of living organisms. So like we have been uh, defining the uh, ecological niche of organisms by using functional traits of different kind. We all know about the, uh, the like niche of plants with the, with the leaf um, uh, spectrum, right? So we're doing something similar here, but with uh, looking at elemental traits and, and how organisms may have their own like elemental niches. This is ongoing uh, work too uh, with the uh, S Biomaps uh, working group at IDF. So as a summary, um, I can tell you that changes in nutrient and fossil availability can have important consequences on the structure of aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates. The responses of invertebrates to nutrient enrichment seem to be mediated by differences in their elemental compositions, right? Which may reflect their demands for elements to build their bodies. Um, we know that there is a lack of knowledge of the relative importance of uh, potential mechanisms by which ecological communities may respond to changes in nutrient uh, availability. Uh, for example, uh, stoichiometric plasticity versus changes in species composition, as I mentioned you earlier. Um, a lot of the studies have been focused on species specific, specific responses and like only a handful of the studies have been addressing at least considering animals, um, the uh, responses of the entire community. And then uh, we have we know that we have large biases in studies focused on the effects of nutrient enrichment and terrestrial and aquatic communities. And the, we claim that the integration of experiment service and data synthesis approaches can help uncover general responses or the identity, uh, or identify, sorry, context dependent uh, responses to changes in biogeochemical cycles. So I don't know if I have more time. I had a few additional slides of an uh, additional project that I'm working on, but uh, it's totally fine if we uh, end it here. So so generally we, we try to end before noon um, and, and certainly, you know, people can, can leave if they need to. Uh, so, and Helica, it's really up to you if you'd rather take a couple questions or share some slides. I prefer to take a couple of questions. The only thing that I'm gonna, I'm gonna take advantage like two seconds to say, this is a project NSF that is focused on paleoecology and ecology. And I have an available position uh, for a postdoc in my lab. So if anyone may be interested, we can talk more later. Um, or you can like shoot me an email and uh, we, can, we can talk about uh, the ideas behind this project. That's it. <laughs> Terrific. Um, I wonder, uh, Dr. Jane Lucas is on the, on the call. Jane, would you be uh, willing to ask your question? Yes, definitely. Um, hi, just wanted to say uh, what a great talk that was. It was super interesting, um, right up my interest alley. So one of my questions is when you think about that change in um, invertebrate abundance, do you think that the what might be driving that is just a change in the nutrient availability and the stoichiometry? And because of that, do you think micronutrients might be, you know, things like, you know, uh, sodium and potassium might be a good place to look next? Yeah, that is a great question, actually, right? Because uh, traditionally stoichiometry like, uh, has focused mainly on CMP, uh, like, but we do know, and I'm, I'm very familiar with like uh, the work of like Mike Caspari and other people, right? Looking at other elements, for example, sodium. And I think that that's the next step. Uh, I we, we know that so far, there haven't been that many studies, right? Uh, so then it's hard to put that together into like a 
synthetic approach. But I, I will say that uh, there are other culprits. There may be other culprits of these like decreases in uh, invertebrate abundance, uh, like especially thinking on what empirical evidence has shown us in like tropical systems, right? Uh, like how limitation by sodium is like a like an important driver. Yeah, that's a that's a very good like thought. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to do uh, another question. Are nitrogen and phosphorus uptake stable over the life cycle of the organism? Like uh, plants or animals, or it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm guessing the animals. Yeah, they are not. That's another very good question because uh, we know that, you know, like organisms that are growing uh, have higher demands for like these elements. They are building their biomass at like a much faster rate, right? So you would expect that uh, like uh, limitation of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus may be more pervasive in like early state ontogenetic stages. Um, that is something that our like data synthesis project has incorporated. Uh, we, we were able to get data on the, the uh, stage of organisms like in a very coarse manner. We do have larvae versus adults. We haven't looked at that data yet, uh, but I will bet that in many cases, like larvae is going to have a higher percentage of uh, elements compared to uh, percentage of dry mass compared to adult organisms because their demands are much higher. They need to uptake more. Yeah. Okay, I want to be sure that we give you some time to have a lunch break as, as we've asked Dr. Gonzalez to come back and meet with a, a subset of us uh, at one. So we're going to end it there. For folks who had questions in the Q&A that didn't get answered, we are going to forward, forward those along to her. So um, you should also feel free to follow up by email and that she will see those questions. Yeah, I'm sorry about my um, cursor. I have these like... Um, like wireless thing and the batteries just like ran out. So yeah, I apologize for that. You don't have to worry about it. Thank you so much for joining us for a wonderful talk. And Thank you. So I'll see uh, some of you um, at one. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. We hope to see you back next Thursday. Thank you.